and their impact on sexual and reproductive health and rights. These social determinants are closely interlinked with the material conditions experienced by women and girls around the globe, and therefore must form part of an analysis where the realization of sexual rights is closely dependent on the political economy. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing inequalities and has contributed to the lack of progress in reducing maternal mortality, especially where pregnancy complications were not prevented or managed due to disruptions of health services. The pandemic has exposed the impact of consistent defunding and deprioritization of health broadly and SRHR specifically, and resulted in further budget, health budget cuts a state applied a business model to economic recovery. For instance, more than 54% of the countries planning to cut their social protection budget in 2023, as part of new therapy measures, already offer minimal to no maternity as child support. The pandemic demonstrated the structural weaknesses of many health systems across the world, in which more than half of the global population, especially women and girls, already lacked access to adequate essential health care. An effective response to this issue requires a holistic analysis of all the factors that cause preventable maternal mortality mobility, including the state of health systems, unsafe abortion, and deprioritization of SRHR. Using a political economy lens allows us to include an analysis of economic conditions, of aid, of debt, of international funding and technical cooperation models and practices like aid and formulating plans to tackle efficient and harmful service delivery and oppressive health systems that undermine women's human rights, particularly their sexual and reproductive rights. As a stance, we also have laws, policies, and practices and stigma which restrict women's bodily autonomy while under-resourced, fully equipped, and patient heart core health systems fail to provide the full range of available, accessible, acceptable, and quality services necessary for the full exercise of women and girls' sexual and reproductive health and rights, as today's speakers will illustrate for us. Joining us in today's conversations, we have Sanani Palikawa Dana, <laughs> who is the Director of Programs with Youth Advocacy Network Sri Lanka. We have Dr. Anne Kihara, medical doctor and the incoming president of the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics. And we have Maria Luisa Perota, who works at Atahata, and who is also a member of the Sexual Rights Initiative. Turning first to Shalani. How has the economic crisis in Sri Lanka affected the rights of health, particularly for marginalized groups? Yes, uh, thank you, Anthea. So I would first like to start by saying that Sri Lanka is a country with a free healthcare system. So uh, the majority of the Sri Lankan population rely completely on the public healthcare system for their healthcare needs. Uh, despite that, the government actually only invests under 5% of its DG GDP for the um, healthcare system. So there's, uh, anyways, there's a, shortage of funds allocated in terms of the co the coverage it uh, has uh, for the healthcare system and in this scenario and on top of it sri lanka had to go through three key crises in 2019 there was the uh, easter bomb attacks and then the covid-19 pandemic and on top of that we had to face um, the current ongoing economic crisis which is um it's also going simultaneously with the global economic crisis, but Sri Lanka has severe, like specific effects on it that has halted a lot of economic activities um, from functioning properly. The economy has contracted. Um, so one of the first things that has happened post pandemic and the emergency situation that was imposed in Sri Lanka was that uh, importation of drugs. The usual system of importation of drugs was uh, through a procurement system. Um, there, were pro there are procurement guidelines, and although there's no law specifically addressing procurement, it happened through a system uh, calling bids, so on and so forth. But the declared emergency situation allowed the procurements to be done directly. The 
purchasing of drugs to be done directly from the uh, buyers, uh, sellers, sorry. So through that, uh, substandard drugs started coming into the uh, system because there was no check and balance and or transparency uh, in the procurement process of drugs. So as a result, recently there are more and more cases of deaths uh, and uh, inf infant deaths and maternal deaths and most of, most of these incidents happen to women and children. And secondly, um, this this is also this is affected mostly. Uh, this affects mostly the working class people of Sri Lanka who rely entirely on the public health system and the free health care that is provided by the government. And another thing is that uh, the state, the pu public health system being free, the that's an essential drug list that Sri Lanka has. And those drugs are imported essentially. They, those are given uh, priority in the importation of drugs. And this uh, this list is usually revised every two years. And in the face of the pandemic, some of the drugs took a back seat. For example, there was a program to vaccinate uh, adolescent and young girls in the public school system with the HPV vaccine, which started around five, five six years ago. Um, however, with the pandemic, uh, the H the giving HPV vaccine had to take a backseat, and the that justification is that the COVID nineteen vaccine funding for COVID nineteen vaccine has to be prioritized as opposed to any other drug. Uh, but it has not. Uh, now even after the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic has passed to a certain extent, and vaccinations uh, vaccination does not happen, um, the HPV vaccine has not started back again on its feet so that is also on the face of the lack of funds that the government has due to the severe economic crisis that we face um, economic crisis uh, to sri in sri lanka how the effects of it is that we did not have any foreign reserves or dollars to purchase our essential goods even the essential fuel and foods uh, we were not we were not at a place to purchase. It was like a day in and day out purchase that was uh, happening at some point in Sri Lanka. So, therefore, the uh, amount of drugs that could be purchased, the medicines that could be purchased, became uh, limited. And due to the uh, rapid depreciation of the Sri Lankan rupee, uh, the the limit the amount of medicine, the quantity of medicine that we could buy, also shot down. So because of that, there were severe shortages in essential medicines in Sri Lanka. And also, uh, the fact that the dollars were not uh, out there in the open, we, we couldn't access dollars as easily. And therefore, some of the medication that was imported through other means, for example, uh, hormonal therapy for sexual minorities, that also became very uh, difficult to access as a result of these importation restrictions that was that came into being as a result of the economic crisis. That is the other thing. And I was I mentioned how Sri Lanka was facing difficulties even to purchase day to day uh, provisions fuel. We were waiting for a, a fuel ship to come uh, to the ports so that we can unload and it could be distributed all across the country. And that also was, ra was rationed and some people had to wait in line for days at an end to access our fuel. Our fuel uh, and this also had an effect on the power energy grid of the country. And there were sometimes 13 hour long electricity cuts and travel and transport became really difficult. And at one point in all the major hospitals in uh, performing surgeries within the country had to stop, postpone non-elective surgeries indefinitely because of this uh, electricity uh, cuts. And at the same time, med uh, storage of medicines became a challenge because of the lack of uh, electricity. At, uh, although the hospitals were provided uh, with electricity all throughout, that was only for uh, the major hospitals, the base hospitals, district hospitals, and other outlet health uh, MOH officers or the Ministry of Health officers, they were facing challenges in keeping up their services. And also, this is um, 
there were other sub like the ripple effect of uh, this also is that um, going forward people didn't have access to travel and transport and the amount of hospital visits that they would take limited so they would try to uh, cure or to stay as long as they could and make sure that use home remedies and try as best as they could to manage whatever the illness that they would uh, be experiencing within home and that has if has an effect had an effect on the unpaid care burden and care work burden on women uh, which is already something that is unrecognized with the Sri Lankan economy and another uh, perhaps another uh, good indicator that we could look at it is as a free healthcare system with the best healthcare system of the South Asian uh, region, Sri Lanka used to boast a um, hospital birth rate of 99.9%. So 99.9 .9, um, women would give birth in a hospital facility. But as of now, in the past year, we have had 299 home births. So in the Sri Lankan context, that is unheard of. And that is already, uh, that is indicative of the challenges that the economic crisis posed. And um, I think those are the most salient points that I wanted to uh, highlight in terms of how the economic crisis had an effect on the healthcare system and uh, fund shortages that, uh, of the, the challenges posed by the fund shortages that is allocated for the health budget in Sri Lanka. Thanks, Jelani, um, and thanks for really emphasizing the interrelatedness of the economic crisis and the inability to fulfill the rights to health, including limited access to even essential medicines for all due to Italia, the impact of the um, economic crisis on Sri Lanka's currency, um, including the shortage then of foreign currency, um, and how the debt crisis is clearly hampered the ability of the health system to provide access to services or any other context where access to electricity is proving increasingly challenging, um, showing how um, the material conditions, the economic conditions um, pose a threat, like impact whether or not uh, it is possible to provide health services and healthcare that is actually acceptable and acceptable and available and affordable and of good quality, which we're usually discussing in these contexts. Um, and therefore, hampers the ability to provide good quality sexual reproductive health care. And now turning to Dr. Kihara, as someone who is on the front line of service provision, what do you think are the key reasons for the stagnation and the reduction of maternal mortality and morbidity? Thank you so much, Anthea. And I think I'll really start at the top so that we can get the context. Unsafe abortion is definitely one of the leading causes of maternal morbidity and mortality, unfortunately, seemingly renegated to the backseat. We have 73 million abortions taking place. 45% are unsafe. And please note, 97% of these are occurring in developing countries. 60% from unintended pregnancies, which then means we may not be educating women and girls to plan their pregnancies, the interval of their pregnancies, and how often and how soon. And of those 60% which are unplanned, 30% end up with an unsafe abortion. We really need to know that abortion services is an essential service and should be safe timely, affordable, and reachable, and respectfully given when it is really needed. So the question is, do societies really value women to save them and to think their lives are worth being left intact for them to be gainfully productive? I personally feel universal health coverage and the issue around financial hardship has been even alluded by my previous speaker it's unlikely to be attained, particularly when we know abortion care services are not included in essential health packages. WHO did a survey and they showed that 45% is abortion that is safe, but in the majority, 63% is addressing complications from unsafe abortion. 
Now, when you look at it as a clinician, unsafe abortion means what? You need many more personnel. You probably may need to use theater services, longer hospitalization stay. And yet we have moved in technology to the point where we have medication abortion readily available, which is cheaper and cost effective done safely. I want to go to the three delays. Women making decisions, I have a problem or I have a pregnancy which I don't want, or may even have had an opportunity to start the process of self-care. When it does go wrong, how soon does she actually seek the services of the health provider? And even in making that decision, how far is it for her to go to gain those services? And lastly, the appropriateness and timeliness of the services she gets. This is really determined by her social determinants of health. Gender inequalities still prevail. Decision-making in most of LMICs is patriarchal. That leadership that she needs to say, I'm empowered enough, I need to take charge of my body, can be a problem. Then there's the health inequities. I do get to a facility, but does it have what it takes to give the appropriate and timely service? Speaking then to the resilience of the health system. My previous speaker did allude to the fact that even getting the drugs that are necessary are not readily available. Now coming to the politics and the legislature, reproduction is one area that seems to be regulated. We're having decisions made about what to do with our reproductive health. What do I mean? When we talk of talking about comprehensive sexual education with adolescents and youth, that in and of itself is an issue. Contraception amongst the youth, that in and of itself is a problem. Abortion care services, that in and of itself becomes an area that people feel it has to be regulated and therefore, a lot of healthcare practitioners will steer clear because the penal code, even where the legislature seems to give the window for abortion services, is curtailed by a penal code that still does not resonate in tandem. Yet, we look at the Maputo Plan of Action, the human rights um, treaties and conventions, most of our countries have ratified and given in a window of opportunity in which we can assist our girls and women. The other thing is the lack of values clarification and attitude transformation for abortion services. Abortion should be a patient-centric uh, managed problem, not doctor-centric because I feel this is what she needs. It's her to make the decision. What our role becomes is to provide the counseling where you come to a common understanding, ultimately, she makes the informed choice, decision, and executes in that direction. But we don't have value clarification. And in some cases, even conscientious objection amongst healthcare providers, who all then become a, a, a real obstacle in terms of the stigma and the brutalities that even the individuals undergo because of coming in abortion care services. I will not belabor. In my own country, we have Dr. Nyamu. He was incarcerated for one year, having helped women to secure safe abortion services. So the question is, begs rights defenders and ombudsmen being part of the team that we so seriously need to have as we articulate this issue. The lack of social protection and safeguarding, particularly in wars and conflict, human and natural crisis, and protection from harmful cultural practices. Weak data processes, I must repeat this, weak data processes. We are talking about an issue where it's not reported or it's underreported or it's misreported. And therefore we cannot utilize and say in this context, it has informed a priority or the best practices need to be put in place or the policies and the advocacy that must be contextualized. And this, I must say, it depends on where you are. 
Kenya may not be the same as Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka may not be the same as Latin America, but it's only data that actually teases out which direction one needs to go. And finally, I think I need to speak to financing. Ring fencing of financing, and particularly where we speak about official development assistance and the allocations, and how much is really devoted to medical research and basic health sectors. Specifically here, I want to look at maternal, newborn, and child health. As a percentage of gross national incomes, and also as a percentage of all ODAs, either by donor countries or by recipient countries. And this has a ripple effect. If we don't have financing at that level, when you come to in-country, will they really allocate to health and specifically maternal health in appropriate amounts? Add more insult to injury. Most of our systems are decentralized. Therefore, again, yet another layer from the national government to sub-national governments. How much really then ends up being dedicated to maternal, neonatal, and child health, and more so to abortion care services, so that women can then have cost-effective, high-impact processes given to her, as opposed to post-abortal care, which has far, far more um, detrimental ramifications. I'll stop at that and then... Thank you, Dr. Kihara, and everybody else for bearing with us for the disappearing screen there. Uh, Dr. Kihara, you touched upon lots of different, uh, really important issues. Um, thank you for really emphasizing on the way in which our reproductive health is a site of continuous regulation and legislative intervention, um, and how that can have a chilling effect on medical practitioners providing these essential services. Um, and thank you for like, really outlining this broad and intersectional approach to considering access to abortion services, um, implicating and touching upon other sexual rights issues, such as access to contraceptives um, and comprehensive sexuality education. Um, and from what Dr. Kihara was saying, we really heard about the role of unsafe abortion in this sheer quantum of preventable maternal mortality and mobility, um, how abortion services are really an essential service that we do want to have as part of our universal healthcare coverage packages. Um, and of course, the need to consistently address the resilience of our health systems, um, including access to adequate financing of health, health systems, including through cooperative financing. Um, and this segues quite well um, to the interventions from Maria Luisa, with the reminder that Maria Luisa will be speaking in Spanish, so in the room to access English uh, interpretation, please tune in to channel two. So Maria Luisa, we know that unsafe abortion is one of the top five obstetric emergencies which account for maternal deaths, and that it is imperative that safe abortion be decriminalized. In this regard, Argentina is seen as a global success. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the role of civil society and the state of the move towards the decriminalization of abortion? Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes a todas, a todos, a todos. Muchas gracias a la SRI por organizar este panel. Eh, y qué honor compartir con las dos personas que me precedieron, como me recordaron, no hablar demasiado rápido, pero a ver. Eh, sí, la verdad es que hemos tenido un logro muy importante en Argentina en diciembre de 2020 con la ley de interrupción voluntaria del embarazo. Y no quiere decir que esto haya salvado todas las funciones al interior de la sociedad argentina en relación al aborto, pero ha sido realmente un logro fundamental. Eh, en cuanto al papel del, del movimiento social, fue absolutamente clave e indispensable para lograr la legalización de la aborto en Argentina. No habría sucedido sin el movimiento social. Eh, y la movilización en torno al aborto comenzó a lanzarse en los 90, primero de manera reducida, y luego a lo largo de los años fue creciendo el número de, de activistas y el recurso para llegar a la legalización. Eh, con recursos, estoy hablando de dinero, sabemos que los movimientos muchas veces logran mucho con poco dinero, pero que significa que se puede hacer por financiamiento. 
recursos son también contactos dentro de las instituciones, una red de apoyo social creciente, lo cual implicó mucho diálogo con los clientes, con los sindicatos, con otros espacios. Eh, recursos es también mejores capacidades más profesionales para la comunicación y aprovechamos canales y estrategias de comunicación. Entonces, eh, también quisiera valorar esta medida que el movimiento por la descriminalización del aborto crecía, y lo nombro así porque incluyó el movimiento feminista, pero también, aparte, el movimiento de mujeres que no se identifica como feminista, el movimiento de mujeres y a otros sectores, entonces, un conglomerado de actores que conformaron el movimiento por la descriminalización del aborto, y a medida que fue creciendo, fue habiendo diferencias y también conflictos entre los movimientos, y eso que a veces parece una debilidad, pero creo que es una fortaleza, porque permitió tener estrategias distintas, llegar a públicos distintos, ir probando los enfoques que servían, y también eh, mantiene activa una potencia de discusión sobre pensamiento para lograr los procesos de la realidad. En ese sentido, mm -hmm. uno de los aciertos principales del movimiento fue abandonar la narrativa que pretende contraponer aborto con una realidad línea que reaparece en el través de los conservadores, pero es una narrativa falsa. Eh, pues creo que más allá del derecho de las mujeres y la de los hombres a no ser madre o no formar una familia, que nunca vamos a abandonar esta defensa, el aborto es una parte más de la vida reproductiva de las mujeres y la gran mayoría de quienes son madres han abortado o lo han hecho. Eh, entonces, desarmar esta narrativa es clave y no solo decir que si se quiere hablar de proteger la maternidad o un uso de la familia, hay que hablar de garantizar el aborto solar. En cambio, la narrativa consolidó un enfoque clave para lograr la legalización que fue instalar en la discusión pública el acceso al aborto seguro con la operación de salud pública y de justicia social. Eh, el, el trabajo con la legalización comenzó a organizarse en torno a la afirmación de que el aborto sí se ve igual en que esté prohibido, y entonces la discusión no es acerca de si habrá o no abortos, sino en qué condiciones tendrán lugar los abortos que sean. Por eso está con justicia social, porque el atravesamiento de crisis es innegable. Cuando el aborto está prohibido y entonces inseguro, las que quedan con escuelas graves que mueren son las mujeres pobres y las más jóvenes, sobre todo las adolescentes, porque las adultas y las de clase media y clase alta acceden igual a la voz de un que se prohibido porque tiene recursos. Um, entonces, separar que aborto clandestino y aborto seguro no son lo mismo y que la prohibición expone a la voz de un y quienes tienen menos recursos. Uh, entonces, estas discusiones internas permitieron situar claramente el acceso al aborto como un tema de derechos humanos y decir entonces que al no estar dando garantías necesarias para lograrlo, el Estado está incumpliendo sus deberes de respetar, promover y defender los derechos humanos. Entonces quiero pasar a la segunda parte de la pregunta, que es cuál es el rol del Estado. Quisiera ahí como tomar el enfoque de que el Estado no es un ente monolítico, sino que es un conjunto de instituciones donde hay diferentes actores involucrados. En primer lugar, valorar y destacar el trabajo de los médicos y otros integrantes de los equipos de salud en los hospitales públicos y en las salas y centros de atención primaria en los barrios. Porque estos médicos, enfermeros, trabajadores sociales, colegas, otros, en tanto, trabajadores de la salud pública son parte del Estado. Y una gran cantidad de ellos se han comprometido con la vida, la dignidad y los derechos de las mujeres y las adolescentes y proveyeron atención generando condiciones para el aborto seguro, incluso a riesgo de ser perseguidos por otros sectores del Estado, justamente apelando al código penal, como decía el doctor de la eh, entonces, remarcar el valor que han tenido estos profesionales, cumpliendo su lugar médico, pero también como el sector del Estado que garantizó derechos a riesgo de ser perseguido por otros sectores del Estado. Eh, luego, los legisladores de muchos partidos políticos con diferentes posicionamientos ideológicos que votaron a favor de la ley de la legal del embarazo y que tomaron el, el enfoque de que el acceso al aborto seguro es un tema de salud pública, un tema de justicia social basado en la análisis de clases y también de respeto a las libertades individuales. Sobre esos fundamentos, argumentaron que tanto legisladores, es decir, como parte de uno de los poderes del Estado, es que tenían la obligación de votar esa ley para garantizar el cumplimiento de derechos y el acceso al aborto seguro para todas, sin distinciones. Por último, creo que estoy acercándome al, al tiempo, eh, quiero mencionar lo que considero una medida muy notable de parte del Ministerio de Salud de la Nación en Argentina, 
Eh, recordemos que la ley en Argentina se aprobó en diciembre de 2020, todavía estábamos en plena pandemia, y además en Argentina tuvimos unas cuarentenas extremadamente prolongadas, tuvimos encierros durante muchísimos más meses de los países, lo cual dificultaba mucho el poder llegar hasta los centros de salud. Entonces, en ese contexto, algunos meses antes de la aprobación de la ley, el Ministerio de Salud de la Nación publicó en su sitio web las instrucciones completas y actualizadas para la utilización segura de nuestro sector. Solo en nuestro sector, porque en este momento no había mucha persona en Argentina. Pero la información de cómo utilizar nuestro personal de forma segura para la inversión de abortos tempranos autoadministrados fuera de contextos médicos. Eh, y habilitando también una línea telefónica de consulta. Haciendo esto, por supuesto, el Estado estaba haciendo las políticas que la OMS ya había marcado antes y que luego fueron actualizadas en la guía de 2022, que fueron comentadas en el evento de la SRI del año pasado. Eh, y estas decisiones tuvieron mucha repercusión en, en los medios de comunicación. Entonces, hubo una acción directa donde de nuevo el Estado argentino mostró que es un deber de los Estados al menos reducir los daños, incluso en ausencia de una ley que garantice completamente los derechos de salud. Y ese posicionamiento tuvo después un peso muy claro a la hora del debate parlamentario. Entonces, eh, esas excusas de que no hay una ley, no estamos obligados, la sociedad no está lista, el Estado tiene obligaciones, el movimiento social se las reclama, y en ocasiones algunos agentes del Estado hacen lo correcto para cumplir con esas obligaciones y eso a su vez empuja a lograr la legalización que ahí sí nos lleva a un cumplimiento cabal y completo de los derechos de las mujeres y los trabajadores. Gracias, María Luisa. Um, thanks for emphasizing the importance for movements and for states to really center the issue of abortion and access to abortion services as a human rights issue. Make it clear that it's a component of meeting your obligation. And for already beginning to allude to the role of institutions and governments in addressing the issue of preventable maternal mortality. And uh, speaking about the ways in which governments aren't upon this, right? So you can see some movement. Um, some actions coming from various sectors of government, even whilst we're still de dealing with the judicial or legislative aspects of it. And in our second round of questions, we're going to delve just a little bit deeper into some considerations of states and really the importance of taking this more economic justice, political mm -hmm. economy lens um, to how we're approaching sexual rights and maternal mortality. Um, so for Shalani, Uh, why should the human rights system pay attention to economic to the economic crisis and its impact? Um, the main reason, in my uh, opinion, is that uh, the human rights system plays a crucial role in holding the state accountable. Uh, specifically, in the case of Sri Lanka, there are no specific laws to ensure the rights of um, margin uh, groups like women and updated laws on children as well as uh, in terms of abortion laws um, in the past there has been uh, Sri Lanka is one of the countries with one of the most restrictive abortion laws in the world and in the past abortion activists have safe abortion activists in Sri Lanka have been facing difficulties in even advocating due to the state crackdown the human rights system in it We was and have been providing a very uh, formidable alternative platform for those who are um, uh, advocating for safe abortion rights in Sri Lanka to present their case and via alternative means to pressure the state of Sri Lanka to lobby uh, for liberalization of abortion. So that's one. Um, I think uh, one of the ex uh, examples that I was mentioning earlier on how the essential drug uh, uh, list is decided and on the basis of how it is decided and why some drugs are being dropped down. So those things, sometimes it can't be questioned um, or it won't be questioned uh, as uh, vigorously within the uh, domestic platform. So the human rights system can be that... Um, system or the play that role of holding the holding the state accountable in making sure and questioning and 
to give reasonable justifications as to why these things are happening. And another example uh, that we can look at it is despite several domestic uh, campaigns and the pressure that is uh, put on the state by the domestic uh, activists and social workers on uh, questioning the basis of why the period uh, the period products uh, for women and girls in Sri Lanka are heavily taxed and are still categorized as luxury goods. So that push, I think the human rights system plays a great, uh, as, uh, as a stakeholder that has great influence on state from another angle other than the domestic pressure to uh, direct the efforts to liberalizing the policies, regulations, and the laws on these things. And another thing is that a healthcare system op doesn't operate on its own. So there's the healthcare system and there are other factors that surround it, for example, and some of the problems faced by the healthcare system or the, uh, the challenges could be mitigated by strengthening certain other systems. Those might not fall um, directly to maybe the health ministry. So the human rights system can look at it at a from a big picture point of view, the eagle eyes view, and address it. For example, um, I was mentioning about how the unpaid care hour burden on women have been increased, and as a result, there are there's a whole lot of other issues that has come into being. So. Uh, and also in the light of the economic crisis and the financial assistance that the government has been getting, social safety nets, uh, social protection has also become a heated debate. So these things, these other things that are not necessarily connected directly to the healthcare system, but are essential for the functioning, smooth functioning of a good healthcare system can only be looked at, can effectively be looked at from a wide point of view. And the human rights system at a forum like uh, the Human Rights Council is an ideal platform to agitate it. That's, um, that's one other reason, one other main thing that I see in uh, the importance uh, of the crucialness of the human rights system to pay attention to how the economic effects have affected the functioning of the healthcare system. And uh, one good example would be how uh, a treaty body such as CEDAW committee can look at a lot of these effects in tandem um, and agitate it. Uh, you can have article 12 uh, in the in CEDO addressing health, and you can also look at other articles such as Article 11, employment. There are a lot of unsafe employment conditions um, and attached issues in Sri Lanka. One being uh, most of the times the sugarcane industry and the rural uh, areas in Sri Lanka where farming happens, there, there are no uh, proper regulations and guidelines on pesticide use. And uh, uh, in sugarcane factories and other factories, there's, there's no proper safety regulations and measures taken place to wear PPEs. So there are women working there, there are pregnant mothers working there, and the and their health is affected and is at risk because of lack of measures. So that can definitely be addressed easily by the CEDAW committee through addressing or uh, compiling recommendations and addressing these issues and directing th these issues to the state under Article 11 of the uh, CEDAW committee. And if it's, it, so we can look at, so, uh, and also another example, social protection. You can take it under Article 14, rural women, and see how social safety nets in Sri Lanka have been functioning and have they been really um, benefiting uh, those who really need that benefit. So looked at in that perspective, um, I think the human rights system plays that crucial role as a stakeholder to put pressure on the state to hold the states accountable and also mainly affording a platform, an alternative platform for those who are advocating for the rights of those who are marginalized. Especially, I think I want to highlight the case of abortion um, the safe abortion rights in Sri Lanka in the context of the, the local movement, local efforts of changing or uh, agitating for the liberalization of the law has been, uh, it has been shut down 
However, the consistent agitation for liberalization of the abortion laws in Sri Lanka have been coming from the human rights systems. The CEDAW committee has consistently been recommending the state to amend the liberalize the uh, abortion laws, although it hasn't happened. But that effect of a uh, uh, person or like a body that is monitoring and looking at the well-being of the general populace and the ensuring of the human rights of the larger populace is very important and that low role is uh, played by the human rights uh, system in my opinion. Shalani and Ali. Uh, and thanks for consistently reminding us to consider the issue of care and to think about things across uh, sectors and across institutions, even as we're thinking about what state accountability in the human rights system looks like, um, for emphasizing the importance of labor rights and of social protections. Um, and turning now uh, to Dr. Kihara, uh, what would you, what role do you envisage as a doctor and as a part of FIGO um, for states and interstate bodies to ensure that there is an end to, pre to the preventable deaths of women and girls and maternal morbidities. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will start back a little bit. SDGs, we're in the midline. Question is, are we really going to achieve it? And when I'm saying achieve it, I'm looking particularly to girls and women's health. In and of itself, the SDGs is an investment. Development will not happen without investment in girls and women's health. Abortion rips them of being productive citizenry. WHO, we have the triple billion, where they're saying we're accounting for healthier lives, one billion. Universal coverage for one billion. Emergency preparedness and response for another one billion. Unfortunately, Women, if they're unhealthy, they cannot be productive. Number two, if the universal health coverage does not deal with the financing of provision of safe, legal, quality abortion services, we will be losing many more women. The third thing is crisis. And I think we don't need to belabor. Globally, we have seen wars, we have seen conflicts, we have seen malnutrition, the list goes on, climate change. Again, this is the same thing SDG is asking us to look at. So we need women and girls to be healthy. But that notwithstanding, I want us to now focus on what is the possible solutions. FIGO is a global entity that advocates for women's health and has been working in the space of provision of safe abortion advocacy in various countries. We work through member societies amongst the members that are in FIGO, and they speak to the government. Principally, our advocacy comes through using evidence-based. And where there is no evidence, we conduct the barrier assessments to see what is it that is curtailing um, adoption or taking up of safe abortion services. We work very closely even with WHO because the guidelines and particularly the guidance they provided us, the last abortion care guidelines, really has been pivotal in addressing provision of services. So this is what I want to report as solutions that have come from the field. What are people saying? One, we need to look at the normative environment, politics, goodwill, the physical space, the legislature, interpretation and implementation, and the policy environment. Resilient, robust health systems should have competent healthcare providers, financing, infrastructure, technology, embracement, and particularly in this case, embracing of both medication abortion and self-care services. Leadership and clinical governance, and importantly, access of services to the last mile. Strong, real-time health management information systems. Decisions need to be made as up. And not having manual data, by the time you load it up, you lose some, and it cannot possibly provide for decision-making. 
identify within the communities who are your gatekeepers for abortion as influencers. Values clarification, and particularly with the local context in forefront. Terminologies differ. Some people want to talk about reduction of maternal morbidity and mortality and not specifically mention the word abortion. Some will twist it to miscarriage. So you need to come to what is sensitively acceptable within the environment and context you're working in. But you need to still respect it should be patient-centric and should have a minimum standard and norm so the quality is not compromised. The models of services may differ so you may have midwifery-led or other paramedics providing services, but bottom line, can it be quality services? Professional bodies must be in partnership. My previous speaker has alluded to that. SDGs, you must look at the bigger determinants that may be influencing abortion seeking of services and abortion care. Em employment of technologies, telemedicine, teleconsults should be an alternative pathway, especially now in the age of self-care, where one may need to actually have cascaded care. Knowledge translation of research in abortion healthcare. Evidence, evidence means data, data, data. Social and gender justice. And I think really this is where your rights body come in. Rights to life, rights to access, rights to quality, all the rights. Number two is community participation, equity. We shouldn't be having those who can afford services accessing them and those who cannot dying from a condition that can actually be saved. Human capital is critical to remember the consequences of unsafe abortion. You may lose human capital or you may maim this woman or girl. Losing or maiming, it's one too many. We really need to keep the girls healthy, productive citizenry. Then responding also to feminist grassroots, like my previous speaker has spoken, I think that's equally becoming very critical the voices of the communities are out there. Are we listening to them? Are we responsive to their needs and preferences? And this then speaks to the field of advocacy and accountability. And lastly, strategic collaborative leadership. We cannot work alone. We have to move together. We will move faster and we will move further. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Kihara. Uh, and, and now finally, I will give it to Maria Luisa um, to tell us very briefly, um, what has been the impact after the decriminalization of abortion and how has the debt crisis impacted access to SRHR services? Okay. I will unfortunately give you like two minutes. Come on. Bueno, después de la aprobación de la ley, hubo un descenso en la mortalidad y la morbilidad maternas debidas a complicaciones por aborto inseguro. Eh, si bien los números totales de mortalidad materna subieron en 2021 debido al COVID. También se vio un descenso en la fecundidad de las adolescentes porque se fortaleció la prevención del embarazo adolescente no intencionado a través de programas públicos, incluyendo la educación sexual integral y la difusión de información desde el Estado y la sociedad civil sobre acceso al aborto, a la anticoncepción y a la anticoncepción de emergencia. En este momento la principal tarea del Estado y del movimiento es asegurar la aplicación de la ley. Eh, en estos dos minutos quisiera remarcar brevemente la importancia de que la ley de Argentina no solamente despenaliza el aborto, lo cual alejaría el temor a ser perseguidos por eh, hacerse un aborto o por facilitar un aborto, sino que lo legaliza, es decir, lo reconoce como un servicio que está inscrito dentro de un conjunto de derechos humanos de las mujeres y adolescentes, y que por lo tanto el Estado tiene obligaciones en relación a eso, y establece esas obligaciones para el sistema público de salud, para las obras sociales y para las empresas de medicina privada. Esa es una diferencia enorme, especialmente en los contextos de crisis económicas como los que estamos pasando, donde las diferencias de clase en una sociedad empobrecida 
con un contexto de crisis recurrente y una economía atada al dólar que hace que los medicamentos se encarezcan, las prestaciones médicas se encarezcan también. Eh, entonces, tener una legalización que garantiza el acceso en todos los subsistemas de salud es de una importancia fundamental y marca una diferencia enorme. Eh, además, algo que quiero mencionar, porque está ligado a lo que dijeron anteriormente, eh, el Estado está garantizando el derecho al aborto seguro no solo a través de la formación de médicos y otros profesionales de salud, sino también a través de la producción pública de misoprostol en, en laboratorios de varias provincias. Y también ahora, eh, respaldado por la ley, hace algunos meses aprobó la circulación en Argentina de mifepristona, que antes no estaba disponible, y se empezó a producir también en uno de los laboratorios públicos. Tanto el misoprostol solo como en combinación con la mifepristona integran un paquete de medicamentos esenciales que el Ministerio de Salud de la Nación distribuye a todas las provincias para los hospitales y salas y centros de salud barriales. Entonces está eh, garantizando el acceso gratuito a las drogas necesarias para el aborto farmacológico. Entonces, tener una ley que obliga al sistema de salud, que incluya el aborto farmacológico, que tal como dijeron, es más barato que otros métodos de aborto, y que haya producción pública de estos medicamentos, permite mantener los costos más bajos y hace más sostenible el acceso a un aborto seguro, incluso en este contexto de, de crisis. Por eso creo que es súper importante que esté incluido el aborto farmacológico y hablar de la producción pública, lo cual implica que los países tienen que tener desarrollo tecnológico que les permita esa producción pública. Eh, por último, porque estamos bien sobre la hora, eh, quiero decir, en Argentina tenemos crisis económicas recurrentes, sujetas a la deuda externa, a las políticas del Fondo Monetario Internacional, siempre se nos imponen medidas de austeridad y recortes que afectan a la salud y a la educación entre las primeras áreas. Ahora, el recorte en salud no es neutro y cuando se decide qué servicios son los primeros que se van a recortar y cuáles cosas no, entra en juego un criterio moralista y patriarcal que considera que todo aquello que está ligado a la vida sexual de las personas es lo primero que se puede dejar de garantizar. Es decir, lo primero que se recorta es el acceso al aborto seguro, a la anticoncepción, a la medicación para VIH, a las hormonas y cirugías para personas trans, a la prevención de infecciones de transmisión sexual. Entonces, las medidas de ajuste, las medidas de recorte, no son neutras, siempre tienen una carga patriarcal, racializada y de clase, y una fuerte moral sexual. Y con esto cerré. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Maria Luisa, and thank you for your patience. Very sorry. Uh, thank you to all our speakers and to the co-sponsors. Unfortunately, we don't have time for a Q&A, but please catch us, chat with us. We'd love to discuss more on this issue. And thank you so much once again for coming. <laughs>